to start with and see what questions surface there. And we'll see what we can, how we can manage the, you know, the remaining time for questions. And then what we'll do is if there are unanswered questions or if people didn't get an opportunity to ask the questions, they can certainly send them to Meg and Megan can send them to you. Um, Total. An hour in total. Yes. Yes, that'll be challenging. I might miss out the last few slides because I think it'd be to have a, a discussion. So. There's a great deal of interest, so yeah. I'd like to ask people to put their um to mute their mics. Thank you. <laughs> In the nick of time, your internet came back up. It was very tense. We were running around trying all sorts of different uh, possibilities <laughs> through Bluetooth <laughs> and laptops and dongles and heaven knows what. None of it worked. So thank God it's all back up. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to wait and then I'm going to introduce you so I don't eat into any of your time to do the presentation. Yeah. Okay, um start now by introducing um Professor Miki to the anxiously awaiting audience who who um, are joining us today. Um, Susan is a professor of health psychology and the director of the Center for Behavior Change at the University College of London in the UK. Her research focuses on behavior change in relation to health and how to translate evidence into practice. Some topics um, of her work include prevention, adjusting to illness, um, for behavior, how to understand behavior change theoretically, and developing effective interventions. Um, Susan is the Associate Editor of Annals of Behavioral Medicine and Implementation Science. She is um, um, more than 25 research grants for sure um, currently and has published more than 300 journal articles um, and a number of books including, um, which many of us are familiar with, The Behavior Change Wheel Guide to Designing Interventions and ABC of Behavior Change Theory. I'll turn it over to you, Susan, to get started. Thank you, Shinza. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning to you, and it's good evening here. Um, I'm going to go through the slides, and I think there'll be time at the end to ask questions. So um, do just hang on to your questions until we get through them. Um, okay, so uh, I should be going. So I'm going to say a little bit about implementation as behavior, uh, something about the behavior change wheel and how it can be applied and a couple of examples of um, guideline implementation. I probably won't use the second because I think it would be better to use our time in discussion rather than a second example. Um, why focus on behavior? Um, well, what we know is that interventions to improve implementation of evidence-based practice have achieved modest and variable success. And improving implementation depends on changing the behavior of many groups of people, including uh, frontline professionals, managers, commissioners, and others working uh, within and also within the whole care system. Uh, so evidence does not implement itself. It has to work its way through people uh, to change practice. One of the important things to remember about behavior is that it um, uh, it's obviously owned by individuals, and, but influenced by layer upon layer of uh, context. So, including the um, type of person one's talking about, their other behaviours, their general um, lifestyles, uh, the networks, the whole range of different social and community networks they're part of at home and at work, general living and working conditions, and then um, the entire socio-economic, cultural, and environmental conditions. And NICE, National Institute of Health and Social Care Excellence, which um, I think some of you will have heard of, and um, produces evidence-based recommendations. 
options for the UK healthcare system, um, has done a couple of reviews of behaviour change. And one of their findings was that the most effective interventions are those that intervene at many levels simultaneously and consistently, uh, the individual, the community, and the population level. So sometimes you come across debates um, where people um, privilege one over another, but the fact of the matter is um, that it wants to um, have effective interventions and those that maintain change over time, um, it's usually a multi-level um, approach. So um, the main thing I want to talk about today is how to design interventions that are likely to be effective. Um, traditional approaches to intervention design um, have sometimes been um, called the Lagiat principle. Uh, probably none of you heard of this. It was a um, phrase that Martin Eccles, who some of you will have come across, used, and uh, what it uh, stands for in the first letters of, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And unfortunately, um, many interventions are developed on that basis, and I think we can do better than that. Uh, what we need is a systematic method uh, that can start from understanding the behavior you're trying to change. And really, if you take one thing away from this Talk, I would say absolutely think about your target, what it is you're trying to change. Unless you have a good understanding of that, uh, then nothing else will follow. It's like a bit like going to your GP and walking out with a prescription when the GP hasn't done a careful examination, um, formulation, diagnosis, um, similarly with uh, anything to do with behavior change. So uh, that's the starting point. Very important to use a framework that puts the types of intervention that are likely to be effective. Um, I mean, the main reasons why that's helpful. One is so that you don't miss options and narrow down too quickly, uh, but you consider everything. And the second is to have a way of um, thinking about, within all these options, what are the ones that are most likely to be effective for my situation. And important to have a systematic um, method for selecting the particular behavior change techniques one's going to use. So, prevention design. Um, identify the target behavior precisely. So, you start off with an implementation problem. And you have to ask yourself, solve the problem, who to do what, when, where, and how. And really, by um, digging down to the specifics, you're most likely to begin to isolate and identify um, the specific techniques. Too often, people have a general idea of the problem and come with, in, with general solutions. Well, imagine um, the equivalent as you go with a general infection and you come out with a general antibiotic. You know, it's really hit and miss and is much less likely to be effective and much more um, targeted and what's now called precision medicine. And to recognize that behaviors are part of a system, uh, so other, of other behaviors within and between people, they do not exist on their own. And the very first thing I do when um, people come to me to get advice on uh, solving a problem, whether it's an implementation or any other kind of behavioral problem, draw an actual map. Who are the key players here? Who are the individuals um, whose <clears throat> practice needs to be changed? How do they treat each other? What particular behaviors or practices within these individuals? Um, so you can see the whole, whole uh, picture before thinking about, okay, where do I intervene within the system? Um, on the basis of that, make a, a behavioral diagnosis. Um, I'll come on to what I mean by a behavioral diagnosis. And then um, from that behavioral diagnosis, uh, identify the most effective interventions that I um, talked about before, um, needing other interventions that are uh, possible target more than one level. So, for example, of hand hygiene in hospital staff. Um, big all over the world, um, 
doctors and doctors don't clean their hands or disinfect their hands in the situation in which they should um, mean that tens of thousands of people have unnecessary morbidity and mortality. And one thing, how difficult it is to clean your hands. Um, anyway, we have this problem, um, nurses and doctors, but there are people's behaviours in the system that need to be looked at. So infection control nurses, um, their behaviour is um, in terms of conducting audit and feedback. We also have uh, the people who are responsible for making sure that alcohol hand drop is uh, easily accessible where it should be. No point having these suspensers if they have no alcohol hand rub in. So here's uh, three sets of people. There will be many other sets of people too, but this gives you an idea of how to start. Um, if, if one of these sets of people isn't behaving as they should, it's uh, likely to undermine um, the target behavior of hand hygiene. And three, we need to think about who needs to do what, when, where, and how for this to be achieved. So uh, here's a bunch of individuals, there's a bunch of uh, behaviors, and one of the issues is which behavior do I start with? You have some, uh, many behaviors and many individuals. And these are the questions um, that are worth asking yourself. Um, first is, if I change this behavior, what is the likely impact? So obviously we like to start with the behaviours. Um, if we change, we'll have most impact. Secondly, how easy is it to bring about the change? Um, always start with low-hanging fruit. Build on the small successes. There's a, a big literature showing that that's important because it, it, it um, develops people's set, sense of uh, confidence and motivation uh, to carry on and tackle the more difficult things. Um, Preference, acceptability, cost. Go for things uh, people already um, feel uh, enthusiastic about trying to change or have belief that um, there's a point trying to change it. And then about uh, spiller or generalizability to other behaviors and people. Some of these behaviors will be very central in the system. If you change that, there may be other knock-on effects that are positive and other bit more standalone. So that's another kind of um, criterion to think about when thinking we have a complex system here. We want to intervene. Where to start? Um, and the thing is, we might not get the best um, entry point for time off. But so long as one's setting up an evaluation in, in uh, the beginning, or at least a monitoring system, to see um, if our intervention having the desired effect, one can always reassess and evaluate and think, okay, uh, let's step backward and maybe buy. Um, a different set of behaviors or a different set of individuals. About uh, where do we start here? Uh, next thing is understanding the behavior in context. And I always stress this idea of context. Behaviors don't just hang about in a vacuum. They're absolutely grounded in a material and a social context um, that needs to be understood. And two key questions. Uh, why are these as they are? What's maintaining these behaviors? Uh, and when I say behaviors, some people may use the word practices or activities, but the things that people do. And morally, what needs to change for the desired behaviors to occur? Um, because it may be that there are um, changes that are needed that are not necessarily um, the same answers as why are behaviors as they are. And in order to think about what needs to change, um, it's helpful to use a framework, and uh, we produce what is probably the simplest model of behavior, um, which we called uh, Combi. So, uh, a thought experiment for you, all of you behind your screens, uh, and that is, um, for those of you who haven't come across this, think about it for behavior change. What three conditions need to exist for a behavior to occur? And um, one of the conditions is that one things begins with C, one with O, and one with M. Hence, combi, the B stands for behavior. Um, another clue, for those who haven't yet got it, is a U.S. jurisprudence system to prove that somebody committed a crime. 
you have to prove that they had the uh, something, something, and the something. So you probably got in that now. Um, it occurs behavior occurs when you have these conditions. Capab capability can be psychological, i.e. knowledge and skills, or physical ability. Uh, the O is opportunity, and this can be physical environment, but very importantly, the social environment. So this is pretty much the, the context. And also the motivation. And motivation can be what's called in psychology jargon, uh, reflective or automatic. Um, sometimes anybody who come across Daniel Kahneman, uh, he talks about slow and fast thinking, or sometimes people talk about type one and type two processing. Basically, reflective is the conscious, systematic choices and decision making where we're weighing up pros and cons and um, behaving very rationally, and we like to think that that's what influences behaviour. However, the truth is that our behaviour is also very influenced by um, automatic mechanisms such as habits, emotions, drives, impulses, urges, um, the more ancient bits of our, our brain. So we have the kind of down, reflective in the bottom up auto automatic, and actually, and behavior doesn't change. It's often uh, because one's plan brain is saying, you know, the evolutionary advance is saying, I have these goals, I have these intentions. Um, but then the bottom up old bit of one's brain is, you know, much more the, the wants and the needs that is actually stopping one from actually enacting one's intentions. And then you see that these are all uh, linked. Together, and these are part of the system itself. So, um, if you change um, opportunity, you're likely to, in to increase motivation. Similarly, with capability, you're likely to increase motivation. As soon as you begin getting behavior change, there are often knock on effects in terms of increased capability, motivation, and opportunity. So, again, where you intervene within the system will very much depend on your own situation, what you think. Uh, makes sense. So going back to the hand hygiene example, uh, in the UK we had um, a national wide campaign, Clean Your Hands campaign, um, to tackle this issue. And uh, it targeted opportunity, alcohol hand beside every bed, motivation with persuasive posters and a, a, a not surprisingly unsuccessful campaign to encourage patients to ask. Um, the people who designed this didn't really know about issues like power. <laughs> and capability, there's no, nothing to do with capability uh, within this intervention. And you should think, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, nurses have the capability to clean their hands. Um, but and when one thinks about it, uh, what they don't have is the capability to pay attention to that behavior over other competing behaviors. It's about routines for noticing when the behavior doesn't occur, and planning to act differently in the future when they notice the behavior hasn't occurred. Um, and so um, what uh, my, my team did were, was to uh, develop an intervention that uh, complemented the um, opportunity and motivational aspects with uh, some training of staff um, to set goals, observe behavior, develop action plans on the basis of feeds that they got. Um, so I'm just going to sort of summarize in this diagram a uh, way of uh, thinking about intervention design. So just to recap, we've been talking about defining the problem in behavioral terms, which is first step, uh, selecting a target behavior, and I mentioned a few criteria to think about, identifying it in, in its context, what, when, how, with whom, in what context, and adding what needs to change. Um, and I've uh, presented um, now here mentioned TDF, which stands for Theoretical Domains Framework. And I think in this presentation, I um, haven't got time to go into this, I don't think. But in essence, um, the Theoretical Domains Framework is an elaboration of Combi, so anybody who's been using it, um, that's the that case, and uh, I could send, send a slide showing how it, how it fits in, or actually the um, Behaviour Change Wheel Guide, 
um, has has uh, deals with, with all of that. Okay, so, you know, from understanding the target behavior, we're going to go on to designing intervention, which means identifying the general intervention functions that are likely to be effective given your target behavior in your context with your behavioral diagnosis of what to shift in terms of aspects of capability, opportunity, and motivation. Having identified the intervention functions, one can then narrow down to much more specific behavior change techniques. And then, in terms of delivery, there's modes of delivery and generally supporting policy categories um, that are very important for um, really embedding uh, change in the term, both within organizations and uh, within society more generally. Okay, so uh, making the behavioral diagnosis, and um, here we have Combi put into the hub of a wheel. Um, so the reason for putting this into the center of a wheel is this is where one starts in terms of um, thinking about one's problem. problem. Uh, next is considering all the options that are available to one. Um, frameworks, as I said, make life easier, um, but they do have to be good frameworks. And so frameworks that are comprehensive, so you don't miss options that might be effective, adherent, so you can have a systematic method for intervention design, a link to the model of behavior, so that you can draw behavioral science. And very importantly, not too complicated, so it's usable by and useful to policymakers, service planners, and intervention designers. When I was with our, as a consultant with our Department of Health, um, they're often coming up with different frameworks, which is actually why I started this work. And um, many of them just had important things missing, or they're all just a bit incoherent and jumbled up, or too complicated to really be useful. So I thought, well, empirical question, do we have a framework that meets these criteria? Not Systematic review identified 19 frameworks and just looked across the board, not just restricted to health. Uh, none of all those criteria, but what I noticed was that there was a lot of overlap between these frameworks. And also noticed that um, there were sort of two general levels. There were some very direct kind of intervention functions, and there were more um, uh, general overarching what I've called policy categories. So um, we uh, synthesized these 19 frameworks and um, implementation science where the original paper is is an open access. Um, just, just Google baby change wheel and you'll find it. In the um, supplementary files are the, the list of 19 frameworks and also the different steps we use to um, synthesize these. So it was uh, um, identify the intervention functions, which is the red um, so, and uh, policy categories. So um, in order to um, identify the, the intervention functions, uh, it's important to start with a behavioral diagnosis. But here are the intervention functions. So really, all of those frameworks boil down to these nine things and um, recognize them all. Education, persuasion, incentivization, coercion, which is the opposite of incentivization, i.e. if you do something bad, you'll, you'll be punished, fined, or whatever. Training, which is education more about knowledge, training is about skills. Enablement is um, various kinds of supportive activities, so for example, orders and feedback would come under that. Modeling, I role modeling, inventory restructuring, and restriction. And the paper's got definitions of all of those. The idea is that you uh, use the combi, the center of this wheel, to make a diagnosis, and you have a profile of what needs to change. Uh, so it'd be just one of six segments or more uh, in terms of what you think needs to change. And then, um, Using a, a matrix, which is in the paper, you then identify, give a profile of um, capability and opportunity and motivation that needs to change, 
which of the intervention functions are most likely to be effective. Um, so uh, we have this matrix of nine intervention functions, and having identified the intervention functions, one can identify the policy categories that are most likely to be effective. And um, so we're still sticking with intervention functions. Um, and uh, here is uh, the, the matrix. So you see down the left-hand side, we've got um, KT, uh, so psychological, opportunity, physical and social, motivation, automatic and reflective, and the nine different intervention functions. Um, so let's take... Um, the borrow, reflective motiva motivation. So these are your your beliefs, um, things like beliefs that you can change or um, a belief that if you do uh, change, there'll be good consequences. Uh, the intervention functions that be relevant, if that's what you were trying to change, is education, persuasion, incentivization, and coercion. If on the hand uh, you're wanting to um, change, let's say, psychological capability, the second row, uh, let's say, it's skills, uh, the, some education, some training, and also some enablement. Uh, so I kind of get, get the idea. It's a bit abstract, and one really would have to work through it. But again, the book has loads of case studies where it goes um, illustrating um, how this works. Okay, so, so if we go back to our um, hand gene example, uh, we've got um, this diagnosis. We think, okay, what we need to change is helping the um, nursing staff to pay attention to the hygiene behavior over other ones and developing these routines and plans. So uh, here's an example of what we've done. Um, these were psychological capability, and so we um, had an intervention that included education, training, and enablement. Uh, so what we did was uh, we trained the staff, set goals, make action plans, and we enabled them by observing their behavior and giving feedback and supporting the development of action plans. So those were two uh, key functions. And this was by a theory of behavior called control theory. So just to summarize what this looked at practice, um, the infection control nurses, um, who were all anyway, every week they just observed either an individual uh, or a group of staff. So um, this is the individual level component. Uh, so two staff members were observed for 20 minutes, and they were given... Um, immediate verbal feedback se separately. I mean, it was once a fortnight, one member of staff was observed. Um, so we know that giving immediate feedback is much more um, effective uh, than delayed because the person can immediately think back to what they were doing and why they did it, that at that point they didn't engage in the behaviors that they ought to have. Um, now, uh, if, if the observation, and we used a rely observational tool, if there was 100% all the situations in which they should have cleaned their hands, they did. Uh, they, they got a certificate. So this is actually an example of incentivization, which was another bit of the intervention. Uh, but it didn't. Uh, they were asked to uh, immediately say, okay, what are you going to, uh, what's your goal for uh, the next time you're in the situation, and what's your uh, plan so that uh, next time you will enact this behavior? Think back to the idea of having more than one level of intervention. We wanted to target uh, the group level at, at, at the ward. So, um, in once a month, I think it was, uh, a group of staff uh, were observed. Um, and the ward group had, had already got their own goal of you know, X percent of um, times that they would be aiming for. Then uh, they would um, get feedback at ward meetings, and they would then display it in charts, etc. So basically what it looked like, and, and uh, we've written up in a series of articles, um, one 
of the interesting things was this very good implementation of the individual level, uh, but not the uh, group level, because um, it gets getting dropped off the end of uh, busy ward meetings. So, so we piloted it and you know, all the stakeholder meetings, etc. when it came to it, um, that, that wasn't implemented so well. How uh, we um, trialled this, uh, step wedge design, 60 wards and 16 hospitals, and uh, both use of the circle hand rub tripled um, compared to uh, the sites that didn't have the intervention at that point, and also um, infection decreased. And giving one-to-one -one feedback led to the staff being 13 to 18% more likely uh, to clean their hands. So um, this is an example where the original campaign only had the opportunity motivation targeted. Um, and when I was brought on to do this nested trial within the uh, longitudinal evaluation of the campaign, and I spotted that capability was missing, uh, I then you know, was able to add this additional element, which, um, you know, arguably um, they wouldn't have had these kinds of results if it hadn't been for that. So that gives an example how you can use it to really consider um, all the options at the beginning. Okay, uh, so on to policy categories. The decisions made by authorities concerning interventions. So starting from the top, we have guidelines, environmental and social planning, communication and marketing, legislation, service provision, regulation, and fiscal and really important uh, for long-term maintenance. Um, the intervention I've just described on hand hygiene was developed in order for it not to take additional resources within our, within our current healthcare system um, so that it could be embedded and be maintained. Um, and happening in so many countries all over the world, uh, you know, austerity hits, there's all sorts of cuts and privatization and fragmentation. So, Sadly, um, it wasn't sufficient to um, keep going in that sort of situation. But you can see here, if uh, one had a government that was committed to this sort of thing and really backed it up with some of these kinds of policies, it would be much more likely uh, to be maintained over time. And in terms of uh, which policy category should be used, again, there's another um, uh, matrix where you can say, these are the intervention functions that we want to have supported by policies, which are the policies that are most likely to be helpful uh, for these intervention functions. Ah, oh, something about the theoretical domains framework. Okay, so the theoretical domains framework was um, developed actually as a result of implementation researchers um, many, many years ago, uh, recognizing that implementation depends on behavior and that uh, designing interventions is helped by having uh, some kind of understanding of behavior and behavior change, and therefore uh, going on theories. Um, but also knowing there were a lot of different theories of behavior change, and uh, a lot were overlapping, and it wasn't clear which to use and how to apply them. So uh, myself and other psychologists, such as Mary Johnson, um, began Think about all the theories and constructs and how we could integrate them into a simpler uh, framework and worked with implementation researchers such as uh, Jeremy Grimshaw and Martin Eccles to look and see how that can best be um, uh, used in terms of guiding implementation research. And so um, then when um, but the behavior change wheel through a completely different uh, route, i.e. not through theories of behavior tame at all, behavior tame at all but through the um, general frameworks I talked about, um, I remember Jeremy saying to me, Susan, you're exasperating because, you know, we've got used to the theoretical domains framework. We're finding it very helpful. And here you come along with Combi and the uh, behavior change wheel. How do these two things relate to each other? So I thought, well, that's a good point. Um, and went back and looked at it, and actually very validating, because um, what you can hear is that the, um, down the, that on the left-hand side are um, 14 domains. Um, the original um, one was 12 
but we did some validation work um, and um, it seemed to be more like 14, but uh, that sort of detail really. But generally what you can see is that the, the, the domains, the general domains that theory was synthesized into maps extremely well onto uh, the combi. So we have um, the, the top here left, social influences. Well, that's just the same as social opportunity. Environmental context and resources. That's the same as cool uh, opportunity. We had um, going to list their capability. We had physical uh, capability, um, which is uh, physical skills, the same thing. And psychological capability, here more elaborated. So um, the theoretical domains framework is just a more elaborated version of, of it. So um, there are four different uh, sort of psychological skills here um, or capabilities. So one is knowledge, uh, one is cognitive and interpersonal skills, one's memory, attention, decision processes, and one's behavioral regulation. Um, that sort of management, like monitoring and action planning. Um, and then automatic motivation is divided into uh, reinforcement, sort of rewards and punishments, and emotion. And then the reflective motivation has got several subcategories. So here we have um, professional role and identity, beliefs about ability, a general optimistic outlook, intentions, goals, and beliefs about consequences. So really depending on how elaborate one wants to get, one can either just stick with capability, opportunity, motivation, and sometimes with policy makers, when I work with them, I don't go beyond that, but one can get a little bit more nuanced and uh, detailed and go to the six segments, or one can get, um, go a further step and um, go to the uh, 14 theoretical domains. Okay, so the behavior change wheel has been used uh, for designing interventions and policies. And at the UK, it's being used by a lot of government departments. And what they're doing is, um, and is, is what I'm doing, retrofitting. So looking at their current interventions and policies and uh, thinking, okay, well, let's look and see uh, what's missing when we look at the behavior change wheel. Which intervention functions and policies are missing? And they say, okay, Let's think about, is that because um, there's a good reason, for instance, is there evidence that this isn't going to be effective uh, in, in our context? Or is it that it might be effective, but it's not going to be politically acceptable? Or is it that we don't think about it and we need to go back to the drawing board and um, consider it? It's all the framework uh, for evaluation in terms of uh, giving an idea about these general functions, how are interventions working, so one can design it and I uh, think, okay, these are general intervention functions. Let's look and see if this is really how the intervention is working. And then through the systematic reviews. So, so NICE has used it, for example, in its um, update of uh, looking at behavior change. And it's been um, used in uh, many different countries and quite a range of different um, health, mini health situations. So this gives just some, some examples. Okay, I'm going to quickly go on and uh, think about, okay, these are very inter general intervention functions, but let's um, hone now down into more specific techniques. And what do I mean by technique? Uh, so we've defined them as uh, discrete low-level components <coughs> of interventions that are on their own and have the potential to change behavior. And the first um, uh, taxonomy of behavior change techniques um, that I developed again as a result of working with the Department of Health uh, looked like this. There were 26 techniques. Um, these are the kind of things we're talking about. And this is very much inductive, bottom up, just looking at intervention descriptions and isolating the smallest components that were mentioned there. See those ones, 23 to 26, relaxation, uh, modal interviewing, time management, stress management. These are bunches of stuff. But it was reported just like that. It wasn't reported in any more detail. So, you know, we just had to leave it in at that level. But in order to ensure that um, people were um, describing interventions with the same words, meaning the same things, we did very uh, detailed definitions of each of them. So there's a couple of um, goal-setting 
property monitoring. However, um, that was back in 2008, and we developed quite a lot of different um, taxonomies in different uh, domains. Um, but then, actually, what we want to do is uh, let's not fragment the field, let's bring things together. And so we had a MRC a grant, and I think in total had 400 international experts working with us to build on the published taxonomies and produce um, a much more comprehensive um, list of um, techniques with much better laws and much better definitions. We had um, input across uh, not only different countries, but also different disciplines and different types of health domain um, to try and uh, ensure that it was as um, transferable and usable uh, across as many domains as possible. Now, TBI items is, is a lot, and so we did some work to look and see how people were using them, uh, and they grouped into 16 uh, general groupings. And just to give an example um, here, um, at the top left hand, uh, the very first grouping, we've labeled goals and planning. And you can see nine different labels. And for those um, labels, there's a definition and examples. Um, so um, pages and annals, and again, has supplementary files where all of this is. Um, you will see all those. But uh, give an example of just that very first technique. Look at 1.1, goals for behavior, i.e. you set goal not in terms of outcome, but in terms of what change you want to see. Um, here's the definition of it. Um, as, as what it is, it's also giving you notes about how it differs from some things that may look rather similar. Uh, and examples. So that's better for every single one. And this methodology uh, has been used a lot uh, to um, describe interventions as accurately as possible. Um, which helps both to replicate interventions, to build evidence, but also to implement effective interventions. Because standards of reporting has been uh, really quite poor of implementation interventions as well as other interventions. And if we're not using the same language to mean the same thing, we're really on the back foot when it comes to accusing evidence and um, improving our understanding of what's going on and therefore being in a position to design more effective interventions. Uh, so that's absolutely, absolutely key. Um, uh, so designing interventions is helpful. Uh, so you can be very, um, you know, again, you think about the big picture, all those 93 behavior change techniques. I mean, obviously, you'd only be looking at a, a subgroup because it would depend which of the intervention functions you thought are likely to be most effective for your intervention. Um, also very helpful for evaluating interventions. Um, they can use factorial designs to identify within these complex interventions, which have many behavior change techniques, with the ones that are doing the work, because um, some of them may be um, contributing a lot to the effects, some may be doing absolutely no work, and some may actually be counterproductive. Uh, there's ways in which one can begin to um, deconstruct that. And then so investigate not just what is it that's making a difference, but what, is it? what are the mechanisms of action, the processes of change, et cetera. And then also um, synthesizing uh, published reports and systematic reviews, which is where we started off actually doing this because the Department of Health asked us to answer a question. Uh, we did a systematic review. The intervention descriptions were so vague and so heterogeneous, we thought it's impossible to do this unless we develop um, a language uh, to do it um, so that we could um, synthesize across all of them. Now, a very enthusiastic um, PhD student of mine um, created an app, so it's both in um, the iPhone and also Android, and you just have to search for BCTs. And it's quite neat because, as you can see, it's got the six groupings, and then within each of them, it's got the behavior change techniques, and then it's got the actual definitions for each of them. So it's quite handy. And also, um, it's, it's easy to um, use 
system uh, to define interventions. And so um, we developed as part of our work, and we've made through this online, uh, a training course uh, where you can go through um, a lot of material and get feedback um, in terms of learning how to code this unstructured uh, text you know, intervention descriptions into specific behavior change techniques. So in terms of which behavior change techniques to select, because just uh, going back to um, the thing, you've done your behavioral diagnosis using COMBI, you've selected one or more general intervention functions, you um, looked at the intervention functions and in the um, behavior wheel guide, you will see tables where you can see which of the major change techniques that serve which intervention function. So you'll have a whole bunch that you could use, um, but, but which should you select your own context? And um, here we've produced something called the APPEASE criteria, and APPEASE is standing for following. Uh, in which behavior change techniques you, you, you need to think about, so your context, What's going to be affordable, practical? Also, you need to go to the literature and look at effectiveness and cost effectiveness. All issues about acceptability, uh, not just to professionals, but also public and politically. Uh, effects and safety. And uh, this should actually read equity, not equality. Equity. Really important um, as to uh, are you going to increase or decrease um, the kind of uh, inequalities that there are in, in health with what you're doing. So those are some of the, the key things to say. And I mentioned about maintaining behavior change before, and this is absolutely key. Um, this was enough initiating behavior change, but maintaining it is harder. And if one doesn't maintain it, then you know one's not going to get the um, health benefits that one's aiming for. Um, so really, here's some generalization. If, if you just rely on individual choice and decision making, it's not likely to maintain itself as much as if you actually embed it um, within the environment and make behavior more automatic. So it's not down to humans think every time about it. So it's like environmental support and prompts, building routines, having that mechanism built into systems, rewards and incentives, very powerful uh, behavior change techniques. Okay, so I'm going to just skip over this um, because this was. Uh, um, in to some work I did in the in the UK, and I prefer to have time for questions. So to recap, uh, start by, by understanding the problem, uh, then uh, understand the behaviours and what needs to shift. Consider all the possible interventions, supporting policies, and um, the change techniques. And then obviously evaluate. Uh, get your evaluation strategies in at the beginning, so it's possible to accumulate evidence to inform future interventions in advance so you can both think about how it's working, the kind of process measures and reasons for variation. Um, here are key collaborators, my research group, and um, this is the website of the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change that I'm director of that has a lot of uh, resources on it, uh, including um, uh, lots of events and materials and podcasts, etc. So do go and have a look. And we actually launched our book today, um, which is called Thinking About Behaviour Change, an Interdisciplinary Dialogue. Um, so uh, that's, that's uh, details of that available there too. So that's, that's me. I've uh, rushed through a lot of material very quickly. I hope you've taken some of it in. Um, but I think we've got, um, well, I don't know what your time is like, but uh, 10, 15 minutes for um, questions and discussion, which is usually the most informative bit. Thank you for talking us through that. I think it was um, very clear and comprehensive and, and um, action for some, but a, a good um, summary for others. I'm going to start in the West Coast, um, the University of Calgary. Um, any questions from the University of Calgary? Nope, nope, Janet. Janet. Um, so, left to Winnipeg, the University of Manitoba. Thanks. 
I think I skipped over the University of Alberta. Yeah, we do have questions here at UFA. Yes. So, sorry, did you say you did not or you do have questions? Oh, we don't. We don't have okay. okay, wonderful. Thank you. So, let's move to Ontario um, and St. Michael's. Here, thank you. Okay, um, and we'll stay in Toronto and go to the Women's College Hospital. Okay. Um, and staying in Toronto to the Public Health Ontario. Hey, uh, thanks for your presentation. I don't think we have any questions right now here. Okay. So I have comments. Yes. <laughs> I'll comment as well. Yeah, yeah um, of course, because they, they, yeah. Okay. So we'll go to Ottawa and the OHRI. No questions here. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So, so um, come back. Uh, sorry, I've missed two more in Ontario. So, McMaster. Hi, yeah, uh, Robbie Newlaut here at McMaster. Uh, thanks, Susan, for a great presentation. I just had uh, one question and remark. Uh, yeah. I think we've done a systematic review to summarize the evidence for barriers to hypertension control. And we used the theoretical domains framework to label that. And I found that it's a very useful framework. It looks very nice, uh, but it, it's pretty hard to do, actually. Uh, so I was yeah. wondering if you have any advice on how to figure out what actually the problems are, because you can rely on observation, occasional observations, but do you have any as how to do this reliably and structurally? Well, one thing we might like to do is to look at um, a book that's recently been published in Implementation Science by somebody in my group, uh, Siri Steinmo, S-T-E-I-N-M-O, and she was looking at um, the implementation of guidelines for um, septicemia. They're called the sepsis 6 guidelines here. Um, and what she did was to have three sources of information. So she... Um, did focus groups, so she structured um, interviews around domains to try and um, get a window from what people were reporting about their behavior and um, getting ideas about uh, which of the domains were the ones that seemed to account for why the guidelines weren't implemented um, as frequently as they should be. Also um, did some docu document analysis, so looked at their protocols to see you know, are things missing there in terms of some of the um, domains? And then finally, she did some observation. So, you know, she sat in the uh, wards and followed people around and looked to see what they were and weren't doing. And those three sources of information together uh, to build up a picture. And on that basis, um, then improved an implementation intervention that was already in existence but wasn't being very effective. Um, so the first has been published, and the second one's um, in, in the pipeline. I think I think going to be published there also. So I would say that um, it's a, it's really important to have more than one source of information. It's like having three lenses on one on one uh, uh, issue, um, and also to try and keep things simple. Um, so you know, the theoretical domain framework is a long list of things. And um, one can either maybe start more simply with just thinking about capability and opportunity and motivation. Or um, another colleague of mine, Lou Atkins, she's used it by doing a sort of screening to kind of screen out some of the domains to begin with and then looking in more depth at just a few of the target domains. So that's helpful at all. Uh, that, that, uh, helpful, that makes it a bit clearer. Uh, just that's uh, what we did was we looked at all the 
potential uh, domains in the theoretical domains framework. And yeah, we had this problem there. We had so many different domains. Some had evidence, some yeah. did not. And then you try to turn it into a questionnaire to assess your own barriers or uh, uh, enables. And yeah. it becomes pretty burdensome uh, if yeah. Yeah. the clinicians, what kind of questions they do that are useful. And some of these domains they didn't yeah. find useful to answer. So. Uh, so I think one needs to do a screening, you know, a, a sort of two-stage process where you screen out some of the domains. And I do think it's so worthwhile, um, you know, co-designing, you know, working with people in the field. So, uh, for example, Siri and also Lou, <coughs> they kind of worked with clinicians in the field uh, to get an idea of what things definitely aren't relevant. So just excluding some things that aren't relevant. Um, so, so long as one's got a systematic method and one's documenting what one's done, why one's done it, I think to have this initial phase uh, where you, you screen out domains that aren't going to be relevant for your own situation is, is helpful. You can do it from, you know, combi to begin with and they'll see, you know, is it capabilities or opportunities that motivation? You know, it's not all those three. You immediately take out a whole lot of domains. Um, so that's that's what I'd do to stage it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Susan. Thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, very elegant model. Uh, I go back to the simplicity or at least reproducibility part of this. If you would like to comment, uh, it's me that all this comes down to the individual level because you were trying to change the behavior of individuals, but. but you need a very extensive process for finding out for an individual what kind of things might make a difference to their behavior. And I don't know how to deal with the variability from person to person, how you would even describe the intervention, given that there's so many facets for each individual. You would how standardize the intervention enough to be able to tell the people how to do it so that they could then adopt in their own uh, purposes. Okay. So, I mean, this is really, um, in terms of some of these interventions, is being done at a much more to group level. You know, for, for this group of staff in this context, what are the main, um, main domains, uh, main aspects that need to be changed? Um, and that doesn't account for individual variability. Uh, so it's not going to be of all. If, if one thinks that the reason that, say, um, in 2009, uh, the pandemic flu vaccine was re really um, poorly offered by health professionals, um, the, general, the general explanation for that was, was motivation for various reasons. And so if one wanted to develop an intervention to try and change that, one would need to tackle motivation. It wasn't a, a, an issue of capability, it wasn't a, an issue of opportunity. Um, but that means that um, everybody was unmotivated. It just means that the general, um, the general uh, grouping was unmotivated. So you'll always get variability. Um, when trying to get down to an individual level, um, one do it in this way, um, but new technology is allowing one to get to be more individual because um, it can then be targeted much more individual. So, you know, having, having interventions, interventions that are backed, backed up with smartphone apps, uh, for example, uh, are ways in which one can then, um, uh, people can select the kind of um, support that's going to be most relevant to them individually. Does that answer your question? I in part, this quality issues related to finding the people to be able to do these uh, diagnoses. Is it? Oh, you mean, um, who's going to design interventions? Who's going to execute interventions? Going to execute interventions. Well, one absolutely has to, um, you know, the system that we're going to change. So, for example, in the example, the example I gave you about hand hygiene, um, we knew that there were um, infection control nurses in the hospital 
who are motivated um, to deliver an intervention because their incentive, their incentive structures were to uh, reduce um, infants in the hospital. So we were able to work with that group. So I think it's a very good point you raise. Um, within any system, look to see what's already going on and what can be done differently rather than think that one has to add something. Because at this age, with um, such pressure on resources, it's very unlikely that there's going to be any extra money. It's a question of just um, doing things differently so things become more effective and, efe and efficient within the resources that there are. And that will vary from situation to situation. There's no one answer to that. Thank you. We only have time for one more quick question. Um, so I'm going to try the Laval site. Hello, thank you very much, Professor Michi, uh, not only for the great presentation, but also the inspiring career. My question is as follows, Francis Gary on the call. Uh, where would you uh, fit uh, emotion and affective uh, aspect? Would this be under capability or opportunity? Ah, no, it's under automatic motivation. So, because often when we work with some uh, healthcare professional, one thing that they find very difficult as a, maybe a barrier or some sort is uh, the emotional load or uh, uh, yep. difficulty in some of the, the work they have to do. So that would be under motivation? Yes. Yeah. So the um, emotional response is part of the motivational system. However, in terms of um, helping to change emotion, um, then you may want to uh, look at capability. So these things are related to each other. If you remember the original um, combi model, if I can go back to it. Um, I like it. Uh, there we go. Um, so what you see here is um, under the automatic mechanisms and motivation uh, are things like um, habits, and emotions, and drives, etc. And um, if we want to uh, change motivation, uh, for example, maybe we want to reduce stress because you know stress is demotivating people. One way of doing that might change the opportunity i.e. the physical and social environment that's causing the stress, or by changing the capability by, for example, often stress management training to staff to help them identify the situations in which they become stressed, identify early warning signs, and the kind of um, skills that they can use uh, to prevent stress build up and also managing it when they notice it. Um, so, this is, I said about it being a system, it, it sits with a motivational structure of human functioning, but one can change it through capability and opportunity. Thank you. This is helpful. I oh, apologize for those that haven't had an opportunity to ask a question, but we are at our time limit. And, but Meg did indicate to me that if we sent our questions to her, she would pass them along to Susan. And Megan, what would be the opportunity, or what, how would, what would be the process for then sharing Susan's responses? Um, done in the past is um, I will gather up all the questions into one email and send them uh, to the presenter, and then um, okay. the presenter will send back, and I'll just send them out to the group. Okay, so thank you so much, Susan, for um, this very interesting and uh, exciting tour of the work that you've been doing around designing um, behavior change interventions. Thank you very much. I uh, hope it's been helpful to people and um, hope to meet some of you before too long in different parts of the world. Okay. Thank you very much, Jen and, and Susan. Bye.
Thank <laughs> you. 